Welcome to Machine Learning. In this first week, we're going to introduce the Python programming language. Over the course of this week's video lectures, we will show you how to define and manipulate simple variable types, mathematical operators, and Boolean conditions, use Python lists, tuples, and dictionaries to group objects together, write loops and functions, and control flow through Python programs using indentation, and towards the end, we'll introduce modules, packages, and classes. Essentially, these are software libraries that will allow you to perform more complex tasks like linear algebra and even building entire machine learning models. You'll need to know a number of packages, but this week we'll just focus on one, the matrix library NumPy. But before I begin, a couple of key points. Firstly, in the Getting Started video, I suggested that MATLAB and Python are very similar, and they are. But in this slide, I want to highlight some key differences. Firstly, in MATLAB, you will be accustomed to using a semicolon at the end of each line to prevent the MATLAB interpreter from printing out the value of a variable. In Python, this is not necessary. The interpreter will not print by default. Second, the flow of code through Python is controlled or indicated through indentation, that spacing from the left-hand side. This means that unlike MATLAB, there is no need for end statements. And third, in Python, array indexing starts at zero. That means that if you want the second item of an array, you must index it with the value one, not the value two, as you would do with MATLAB. This is the potential source of a number of bugs. But don't worry, this is not the only time we're gonna mention these key points. Throughout the course, we'll keep reminding you of them. And at any stage, should you need to be reminded of how to convert a MATLAB expression into a Python expression, you can use cheat sheets such as those indicated at the top of this slide. The last thing I want to emphasize before we get on to doing some coding is the importance of commenting your code. Whatever language you are writing code in, you must comment your code so that other users can understand what was intended. In Python, code comments are indicated using a hash. That means that if the Python interpreter sees a line of code starting with a hash, then it will ignore it. Throughout these lectures, we will use code comments in our Jupyter notebooks to explain the meaning of the code. We will also use them in the tutorial exercises to indicate what we want you to do and where we want you to do it. So let's get started. The first thing we need to do is open the Jupyter Notebook corresponding to this video lecture. That's Notebook 1.1, Introduction to Types and Operations. To open the Jupyter Notebook, we have two options. First is to use the Anaconda Navigator as we did before. The second is to do it via the terminal. So let's try that approach. So opening the terminal on my Mac, I can open a Jupyter Notebook just by typing the name of the application. However, what I want to do first is navigate to the directory where my files are, so I can do that. So this opens a Jupyter Notebook in my browser, and from there I can navigate to the files. So hopefully now you can see the notebook. In each notebook, I provide extensive notes in order to support learning. So let's scroll down until we get to the section on variable and types. And then I suggest we return to the slides as these are easier to follow. So in this video lecture, we'll cover three simple data types, numbers, strings, and booleans. Starting with numbers, for this course, you'll need to use integers or whole numbers, for example, the number 9, and floats, real numbers, such as 9.3. In this example, my int and my float are variables inasmuch as we've created an object, given it a name, 
and assigned it a value, in this case a number. Note, Python is dynamically typed. This means that there is no need to declare the type of variable before using it. So what that means, going quickly to the notebook in order to demonstrate, is that rather than in C, where you have to declare the type, in Python, there is no need. This is because the Python interpreter automatically infers type from the syntax. That does mean, however, that if you write variable in the following way, passing it a number without a decimal place and ask it its type, it will return integer. So if you intended to initialize your numbers as floats, but you're starting with a whole number, then you need to cast it as a float to tell the Python interpreter what you intend. So now it's going to know that it's a float. The next type of variable we should look at is strings. Strings may be defined using single or double quotes. However, should you, for some reason, require an apostrophe inside your string, for example, Steve's dog, then you need to use double quotes in order to be able to differentiate from the apostrophe inside. The next type worth mentioning is the format string, as we'll use this regularly to print the output from our programs in order to understand what's going on. A format string allows us to combine other data types into our string, for example, integers or floats. To understand how these work, it's probably easier to look at them in the notebook. So let's scroll down to format strings. So here, the format string allows us to combine a regular string with other data types. For example, I can create the string and run this cell and it will return the first argument is 1 and the second argument is 2. So this corresponds to the arguments in the format function here. So the first curly bracket takes the first argument and the second curly bracket takes the second argument. This is the functionality by default but if you wanted to change the order then you could just index them. So the second argument is indexed with the number 1 and the first argument is indexed with the number 0. So doing it this way will swap them around. So here you can see the first argument is 2 and the second argument is 1, which is obviously swapping these around. The other thing we can do with format strings is control the precision. So for example, so here we can insert the first um, argument, then we put a colon, and then in order to control the precision, we need to put a decimal place, however many decimal points we want to print out, and F to indicate it's a float. This now prints out pi to three decimal places. We can do the same for the second argument. So index one, colon, decimal place, and this time we'll do it to one decimal place, and run it again. This rounds up to number three. So back to the slides and mathematical operators. So hopefully many of these should be self-explanatory. If you need to perform an addition or a subtraction, you need to use the plus or the minus sign. Multiplication is indicated with an asterisk. If you want to raise to the power, you use a double asterisk. So 2 to the power 3 is 8. Division is indicated with a backslash. An integer division is a double backslash. 
So here, what you're asking for is how many whole times can the denominator go into the numerator? So the integer division of 3 by 2 is 1. The modulus operator, on the other hand, given by the percentage sign, returns the remainder. So the remainder of 9 divided by 5 is 4. Interestingly, operators also work on strings. So you can concatenate two strings together with the plus sign. So if you write hello plus hello, you get hello, hello, both words concatenated together. If you want to do this multiple times, you can use the asterisk. So hello times 10 will print out hello, 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 with hello concatenated together 10 times. And numbers can be cast as strings either using typecasting. So here, this is the string casting function, or as we've already seen, using the format string. Finally, booleans. So booleans are variables which can take two values, true or false. They're typically returned as the result from boolean conditions using operators such as equalities, where here double equals means exactly equal to, and the exclamation mark equals is not equal to. We also have less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to, all as you would write them down on paper. For example, if we had the integer a, which we give the value 10, if we were to print out the expression a is exactly equal to 10, then it would return the value true. If we were to ask it whether it was less than 12, this would also be true, but if we were to ask whether it was greater than 20, this would return false. Next, using not negates the operator. So if we create two variables, a equals 10 and b equals 12, and use Python to print out the output of the operation not a is exactly equal to b, then the result is true. Other options are to use is or is not. These differ from equalities in that rather than just checking whether the value of the object is the same, they check whether the identity of the object is the same. To describe what this means, it's best to use lists. We haven't covered these yet. They'll be covered in more detail in the next video. However, in essence, they should be self-explanatory. A list is a list of objects, and in this case, we're using the integers 1, 2, 3. So in this example, as well as creating list A equals 1, 2, 3, I copy list A to another variable, list B. At the same time, I create an entirely separate list, list C, with the same values as A. If I subsequently use the operator is, I can see that list B is identical to list A. This returns true. However, list C is not equal to list A. This is false. This is because B is an exact copy of A in its entirety. It points to the same location in computer memory, whereas C is not. It has the same values, but saved at a different location. So this is an important difference. And finally, in and in not, these also generally applies to lists or list-like structures. The idea is that you use in to check whether a particular item is in that structure. For example, if we have a list of integers 1, 2, 3, 4, and we want to know whether the number 5 is in that list, we can use the operation 5 in my list. This will return false because obviously the integer 5 isn't in the list. And should you want to chain conditional statements together, you can do so with AND or OR. So, for example, if you have A is equal to 10 and B equal to 12 again, clearly, while A is less than 15, B is not less than 10. So if we ask whether both of these conditions are true, then the statement will return false. However, if we ask whether either is true using the OR operation, then it will return true. You'll see a lot of these statements as we go forward into control flow and talk about if and while statements. So in summary, over the course of this lecture series, you will use float and integer number types, strings, 
which include chars or single characters, words or phrases. Also remember that you can cast numbers as strings and concatenate them to your strings, where an example of where this might be useful is for file naming. We've also discussed writing numerical expressions with mathematical operators and introduced Boolean operators, which you will use to write conditional statements in order to control flow through your Python program. So this is the end of the section on basic types. Before you move on to the next video lecture, please run through the quick Keats quiz, Introduction to Simple Types and Operators, to check your understanding. In Tuesday's tutorial, we'll then go through exercise one, which will allow you to practice these types in the notebook. In the next video, we move on to more complex types, lists and dictionaries, used to save and index groups of objects.